Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Backyard Bounty. I'm your host, Nicole, and today I just wanted to share with you um, something a little different. I was recently interviewed on the Coop Dreams TV Facebook Live for their Teaching Tuesday, and I was honored to be on their show and do some education and answer some questions about raising backyard chickens. And so I just wanted to share this episode with you, um, or rather share that interview with you for this week's episode. Uh, I hope that you like it. I know that it's a little something different, so I'd love to hear from you. Please uh, either send me a message or send me a text via the contact information in the description, um, and I would, I'd love to hear what you think. So I hope you enjoy this episode and find it valuable if you either have backyard chickens or you're thinking about getting some. And as always, thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you again next week. Hey, 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 it's Tuesday. Class is in session. Coop Dreams University, class number 17. Oh, yes, and we have a associate, it's a, a sort of a teacher's assistant here today in William Wallace. Um, this is class number 17. Uh, excited about this one. Been talking to Nicole for a while from Heritage Acres Market. Um, got some fun stuff. Some questions that have been unanswered in my mind. John DeSantos, of course. John DeSantos, I got a special surprise for you. Look, look. Who's here in class tonight? So we've got, uh, let's see, Friday Friday night was chicken poop bingo. We had, I think, 11 prizes and eight winners. So we had some good guesses. Hello, Jennifer, Kyra, Paula, Anita, Bill, Kyle. Okay, Kyle. Well, Kyle, you're good on Tuesday night. So I'm not worried about you tonight. Hey, Julie. Hey, Tina, Ray and Tammy. Um, so really, really cool uh stuff that came out on yesterday merch monday we have uh joined up with the chicken box b-a-w-k-s uh, they are a subscription t-shirt company and they are making the coop dreams t-shirt and william wallace got his t-shirt made by professionals so he's pretty excited about that what else have we got we got a cool teaching tuesday tonight um i don't know we got some other fun stuff this week but what I want to do right now is introduce you to Nicole Janetta from Heritage Acres Market. Unbelievable. I think I'm busy. She's crazy, crazy busy. So listen to this. She's an author. She's got a blog. She has a podcast, Backyard Bounty Podcast, has a newsletter, runs a website, is the North American distributor for poultry nipples out of Europe and then has the time to come and spend with us. So, uh, Master Gardener, correct? Correct. Master Beekeeper? Mm -hmm. And lifelong Chicken Keeper? For the vast majority, anyways. I consider okay. it lifelong. So how, when did you start with chickens? Uh, when I was a kid. I was lucky enough that my dad um, brought chickens into our, our lives as a kid, and um, that was kind of the beginning of the end. <laughs> And have you had, well, you've moved around a little bit, so and, and also I forgot you used to be a firefighter almost a yes. decade as a firefighter. <laughs> so, were you able to with the hours because firefighters they're often in fire stations for a couple of days? Were you able to keep chickens during that period? Yeah, actually, um, with the exception of a small period of time that I lived in Wyoming, I've pretty much had chickens for really most of my life. Um, but I've been able to kind of devise a um, system that really worked well because I would work for um, potentially 48 hours was a regular shift um, with the potential rather to work up to 60 hours. And then when you come home, you're dog tired. Um, so I was able to set my coop up and my feeders and my waters in a way that um, really about once a week or twice a week, uh, just top everything off and it made vacationing a lot easier too. So they were pretty self-sufficient. Do you have, did you have one of those auto doors to get no, from the I, to the barn or was everything all enclosed? Everything was connected. So I had a, a nice size run connected to a, a really good sized coop um, that was all predator safe and everything. And so everybody um, could just be on their own. Okay. I rattled through a few of the things that you do, but I probably <laughs> only scratched the surface. Tell us about Heritage Acres Market, what you do, how it got started and what drives this passion for you. 
Sure. Um, so I started Heritage Acres uh, five years ago, uh, January of 2019. 2016, I guess that would be five years ago. Um, and I started it, to be honest, because I was a little bored at the fire department. Um, I was able to move into a fire station that was a little bit less busy. Um, as a senior medic, they they put me there. Um, and not running as many calls, I got a little bit bored. <laughs> so I started this website. Um, I've always had a passion for learning and for teaching others. And I wanted to um, be able to teach other people about chickens and kind of what was going on in my life. Um, I kind of saw a lot of misinformation that was out there. Um, I do also have some background in bird health. I volunteered at a, a raptor center, which is a rehabil rehabilitation facility for injured birds of prey. Um, so I really like medicine, if you can't tell, although I'm not, you know, a vet. Um, but so I saw a lot of misinformation. So I wanted to be able to to put good information out there, started the, the website. Um, through a series of events, I was able to then become the distributor of the poultry nipples that you mentioned, the original ones out of Europe, not the Chinese ones. Um, and then I started. And that's the big too, blog. because you start looking at quality one. Um, so how does, what, what is special about these drinking nipples? Um, so the biggest thing is they're made in Europe um, and they're made with premium quality materials. So they're actually made for mink farmers. Um, so, you know, mink being a rodent, they they're really aggressive and they can chew and really damage things. Um, so the materials that these are made out of is a premium quality uh, BPA free plastic, premium quality stainless steel, um, really good quality rubber O-rings. And the Chinese ones, unfortunately, don't um, use the same quality material. So they have a tendency to leak. They tend to break. Um, they have lots of issues. And in fact, I I trust the quality of them so much that I even offer a lifetime leak-free guarantee. And I've never had to warranty one. Um, they are really incredible. Um, okay, incredible so here, here you're a firefighter in Colorado. Mm -hmm. How do you secure the North American rights to this European drinking nipple? How does uh, that have, you have to go over there or was it a relationship <laughs> online? No, I didn't. I, I would actually like to go over there. It was something I was uh, hoping to do last year. And then obviously COVID happened. Um, but it was just kind of a series of events. Um, truth be told, I'm not the first person that, that discovered them. It was another gal. And um, she ended up changing careers. And so I think her career focus, um, kind of took her away from being able to invest the time in, in selling them. Um, and then I was, uh, one of the distributors along with one other person at the time. And then when the Chinese ones came out, um, the two other folks that were selling them said, you know what, this is just, this is just too much. The Chinese ones, it's, it's not worth it for us. So they stepped out and I kind of, um, took it on full force. And uh, I really have tried to share with people the difference. Um, and I've been able to work out a relationship with the gentleman that owns the the company, um, owns Columbus Aqua, a great guy. And we've been able to work out a partnership so that I'm the exclusive distributor for um, the US and Canada. Okay, unbelievable how you can get that done with all the other stuff you've got going on. So you start Heritage Acres Market five years ago. Yes, sir. And now, and I, I go on the site, I like uh, the garden planner. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a that's something that we can all use. As you look at where you're at now and where you thought you'd be when you started, are you on track? Have you added more than you thought you'd do? Is it as is, is big as you wanted it? Is it too big? Yes, to all of those, <laughs> to all of those questions. Um, to be honest, when I started it, it was really just... Um, intended to be a hobby. Uh, just, I like to teach. It was a platform to share information with people. Um, unfortunately, I sustained a career ending um, on the job injury, so I'm no longer with the fire department. Um, I, I ended up basically destroying the tendons and things in my shoulder. And uh, even after surgery, it wasn't to the point that I could go back to work. Um, so in 2019, early 2019, uh, I separated from the fire department. And um, so that kind of definitely motivated things here a little bit. I still do have a part-time job, but um, I have the the motivation and the passion for this. And I 
I love this. I love doing this, um, the podcast and everything. And so when I started it, I didn't plan on taking this little uh, website and turning it into something um, bigger than it is, but it's growing and I love it. And I'm pretty happy with things. I'm going to be working on adding video content this year. Um, I'm always looking to grow and, you know, stay current and, and stay with the current uh, social media and stuff. So I, I don't really know where the end is, but uh, I love it. So it's keep doing it until I don't love it anymore, I guess. Good. That's having a passion is, is awesome. Um, I, I did see uh, uh, somebody made a comment that Kyle's going to lose some gold stars. Is Kyle acting up already? Do we need to have a timeout okay. for, I know, and usually <laughs> he's good on Tuesday night. So, um, and, and actually the first topic is, it's kind of weird because Kyle is constantly talking about guineas. I think he's from Dallas and, and he's got some guineas or he watches his neighbor's guineas or something, but we've been thinking about it and we're interested in it. So I've got, my first two questions are one, I hear they're crazy and noisy. And <laughs> then the second question is, how do you get started? What is, you know, with people say you don't need a coop with them. So I'll try to keep things as um, condensed as I can and just kind of hit the key points because this is definitely something I could talk for the entire hour about. Um, so guinea fowl are are crazy wild chickens. Basically, they're um, they're not as tame as chickens are. Uh, they do need uh, food, they need water, and they do need shelter of some kind. So um, I don't live in an area that has a lot of trees. And even if you did, trees aren't really safe from things like owls. So if you can coop train them, that's ideal. Um, I really suggest anybody starting with guinea fowl, start with keats, which is which is what they call the chicks. Um, they just, they're called keats instead of chicks. Um, because if you get an older bird, they might might be more prone to wander where if you get a younger bird and raise them up on your property um they're more likely to stay home they they tend to wander about a five acre area so um they if you have neighbors that could be an issue <laughs> so uh i have a couple tricks for that too but um when you start out with the young keats i would suggest starting out with at least six um and i would suggest getting two to four more keats than you plan on having in the long run. Um, unfortunately, the keats are more delicate than chicks and guineas are not very bright and they find very unique ways to die. Uh, and unfortunately, you more than likely will lose a few in the long run. So if you want 12, I would buy at least 15 um, and, and go from there. So when you say you you recommend starting with six, why? What's the what's the thought behind six? So they're um, a very flock oriented bird. Um, so if you're adding them in with chickens, which I actually recommend, um, that helps. But they don't like to be alone. They're they're very community flock oriented. So the more that you have, the happier they'll be. Um, and then because you are likely to unfortunately lose a few to predators or um, dumb deaths, I call them <laughs> silly ways to die. What's an example of a, a and I, I, don't, I certainly don't mean to be morbid, but what's a silly way to die? You know, I, and when, when I look at our chickens, it's either predator or something, but it's something that you know. Right. Uh, I always, I say guineas are the only bird that can get lost in the corner of a round pen. They, they are really dim, dim witted. And so they have um, that kind of horn on top of their head. And I've seen them on more than one occasion, get their heads stuck in wire because they get tangled up with that horn. Um, and so then you have to go and, and untangle them. I think they just get excited. And then they, I had um, like a, a pile of you know how we all have like a pile of yard um like wire or wood or you know like project material they've i've found them still alive fortunately but caught in piles of debris um just th weird places they get themselves stuck in very weird places and they can't always get themselves out um so I'll always always count them at the end of the day and go looking and so you say that um, you get more than you want because you're going to lose them to whatever, 
when you go to count at night, like I'm, I'm an optimist. I expect all of my chickens to be there. When you go to count at night, are you expecting a guinea to be missing? And do you have to go look for it? So I would expect them all to be there. Um, if there's one missing, then either one is stuck somewhere um, or one could potentially be broody. They they won't brood in um, in their confinement. They'll typically go brood out in the middle of the field. Um, so if it's that time of year, then there might be one missing because of that. Um, otherwise, it's, you know, potentially predators. Um, so I would expect them all to come in at night. And that's one of the reasons that I recommend keeping them with chickens or at least one chicken. Um, you know, chickens don't like to wander. They like to stay close to home and they go home at night, go into the coop. Guinea fowl um, don't always do that, but they don't like to leave anybody behind. So if you put them with chickens or a chicken and that chicken goes home for the night, everybody will follow. Um, if you just have a flock of guinea fowl by themselves, they might decide to go sleep on the roof of your house or the neighbor's tree or God only knows where. So that's part of when, when you talk about getting them as Keats versus adults, you're raising them, you're, you're, you know, you have a brooder, I would imagine just like with chickens. And then when they're old enough, you put them out. But by this time you're, you're kind of navigating their whole process. So they know where their home is. Whereas an adult bird that you rehome or relocate, isn't quite as comfortable with that. And you add the chicken in because the chicken may show the guinea how to roost or where the house is at night. Go ahead. So yeah, a couple things on that. Um, the brooder process is totally the same, um, but I would recommend um, keeping them on large flake, um, large flake uh, pine shavings, not the small stuff. Uh, when I first got guineas, I had a problem with them eating the smaller pine shavings and it was impacting their crop and killing them. Um, they like to be a touch warmer than chickens, just um, a few degrees, but that process is the same. And then when you transition them outside, um, they should stay locked up in their coop or run if possible for 10 weeks. Um, it takes a little bit longer for them to home uh, or to, to realize that that uh, coop is where they need to go at night. And then they don't like going into a dark coop. So the coop should have like a solar light. I, I don't recommend running electricity and, and actual lights into your coop for fire safety reasons. Um, but like those little solar uh, lights that you can get from Amazon, that way there's um, light in there uh, for when they go in at night. So if it's dark, it, is it that they can't find their way in or they're scared of the dark? Both, both. Okay. You said horn, it, it got its horn stuck in a fence. Mm -hmm. That is an actual horn? Yeah, it's like, what it's called? I don't know what it's actually made of. Probably, I don't know if it's keratin or, or I, I don't actually, to be honest with you, know if it's part of their skull, um, but it, it's a hard thing and it, and it, it's, I call it a horn because it, to me, they're like a little rhinoceros, but yeah, it's, it's an actual hard thing. It's not soft, like a, like a chicken's comb. So because they, all the guineas that I've seen seem skittish and jumpy, mm -hmm. you, you don't really want, like our chickens that are skittish and jumpy. We don't really get a really good relationship with them because they're not cuddly and cute. So have you ever had that relationship with a guinea? So going back to that uh, working a lot thing, I actually, unfortunately, have never, with the exception of one chicken, never really had that relationship with my birds just because um, I don't, I'm not around often and I don't have the time to really sit there with them a lot and give them treats and work on picking them up and things. I have seen some folks online um, that have been able to really tame their guinea fowl to the point that they can just go pick them up and you know, they follow them around and sit on their shoulder. Um, but unfortunately, I've never personally had that experience. So they're not warm, fuzzy. They're not long term. You know, it doesn't seem like they make it to a natural. They could be, but. And yeah. why do people get guineas? Because they're incredibly entertaining. They're great watchdogs. They're fantastic for pest control. Um, and they don't damage your garden. Um, I actually sell about a thousand a year here to the local cannabis farmers. What? Um, 
yeah, <laughs> they there's a huge demand for them. Um, not only because they the watch guard uh, watch dog uh, capabilities of them, but they are really good for organic pest control. So the cannabis farmers will let them go out in their fields um, because they do some open outdoor grows here. And um, they'll just go through and they eat the grasshoppers and whatever other bugs are out there, but they don't dig like chickens do. So they don't dig at the roots of the plants. Um, so they really, they work great for a situation like that. So how do they, so that's great pest management. I imagine mm -hmm. it's cost, it, it's, it's good cost wise to do, but if they wander off or if they get stuck and they perish, Aren't you just constantly having to replace your organic pest control workforce? I have a lot of repeat customers. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so those are those are good reasons. When you say watchdog, watchbird kind of thing, where we would keep them, and I, I based on the conversation, I don't imagine they'll stay in there unless they get stuck in there. But from where they are, the driveway is 150 yards away. Would they see somebody coming up and would they make noise because they saw something? So they kind of have a constant chatter, but they'll really sound an alarm. Um, sometimes benign things like the wind blew the wrong direction and they were offended by it. I don't really know, but um, they they are very observant and they they will um, they'll, they'll watch that area. So if if something is out of place or even a vehicle that they don't recognize, um, our guinea fowl. So we. Um, keep them with our chickens so they're all together and I don't free range them every day because we do have a predator issue but when I do free range them or even when they're locked in their pen they are very observant and most of the time they're the ones that tell me that something's going on uh, we had a coyote in our yard one time when I was out in the garden I had no idea because we have a couple acres but the guinea fowl were out losing their mind and come to find out there there was a coyote so um they're great because they watch the air and the land so they'll see a hawk from forever away um they're really good at at keeping track of of really all predators so they recognize your car they know your car mm -hmm. versus somebody else coming in yeah what well, why does everybody say that they're dumb they sound like they're really smart good birds they they are observant but they they get you know, they get stuck in weird places and they're not that bright. <laughs> they kind of uh, panic, you know, and um, they they don't really seem to have a very logical thought process sometimes. And I can relate. I might be part of Guinea. Oh, no. Um, no, that, no. I think, I think that is what we're going to, to add here in the next year. Um, so I'm excited about that. But another thing that we had talked about um, was fermenting feed. And I've heard that um, like we had a, an injured chicken that um, it didn't, it was stuck for a while. And so it wasn't able to get normal grit and everything. And we kind of had to build it back up. So we wanted to ferment the feed so it was softer until we could get the gizzard and the grit and everything. Um, what are the reasons? So the, the two questions are, what are the reasons that you would ferment a feed and how do you ferment a feed? Sure. Um, and just real quick, touching on the guinea fowl, if you get them and you don't like them, they're a really good dark meat that tastes great roasted. They're related to pheasants. So if you don't like them, there's that option. Well, they seem um, to reopen <laughs> themselves pretty frequently. So I imagine if, if somebody yeah. doesn't like them, it's not a long-term problem. No, no, typically. Maybe, maybe a year. But some people, you know, have had better luck. Um, but for fermenting feed... Um, so fermenting feed is a, a really probiotic rich, uh, easily digestible, more nutritious um, and and food saving method of feeding your flock. Um, you I can either um, because the the food. So, um, you know, when you ferment it, you're adding water to it. And I'll touch more on that in a minute. Um, but it expands. So it takes less um, food for the chickens to be full. So, you know let's just say they ate a cup of dry food a day once you add the water to it and it expands to about a cup and a half it's just going to take um less food for them to fill up their cup. Um, so is, are they as messy with fermented feed as they are with dry feed because it would seem like it might clump together a little bit maybe it saves feed that way so with fermented feed um because it is um 
live probiotics, you know, just like yogurt or something that's in there. Um, you should only feed them what they can eat in a half an hour and you should put it in a dish. You don't really want to put it on the ground, um, that those good bacteria and those good cultures start dying pretty much right away once it's, they're exposed to the air. Um, so they really don't waste their food, um, because you're only giving them what they'll eat in a short period of time. So they, they eat it all up, um, because it's wet, you know, they don't really, um, fling it around and it's in a bowl. So they don't really scratch at it. Yeah. Jelena Black says the reason you should ferment feed is to make it last longer, but there's also a nutritional benefit. You talked about probiotic. It, does that naturally come out when you add the water? Or is that something you add in while you ferment it? So um, the probiotics are just a naturally occurring thing from fermentation. Um, just like if you were to ferment, um, you know, other foods, it's it's just something that naturally occurs. Um, but not only do you have the probiotics, but soaking it in water breaks down that um, those seed coatings, which are hard for chickens to digest. So because those seed coatings are broken down, they're able to um, absorb more nutrients from the food because um, typically those those seed coatings are meant to protect the birds. So they they um, aren't able to absorb as much nutrients from it. it. It protects that seed so that hopefully, you know, the chickens can pass it through and then it's a viable seed to, to sprout. Um, so so there's uh, that. But um, yeah, the probiotics are um, naturally uh, naturally occurring. And once you start fermenting the feed, it generally takes three, um, three days to be ready to feed. And then you need to feed it within feed the, to the chickens rather of when, um, it's ready because it will, uh, it will expire. It'll go after a while. It'll kind of sour and go bad on you. Oh, I did not know that. So it's that you just don't add water to the feed and put it out there. It, it takes three days to, mm -hmm. and you have to have it at a certain temperature while you're fermenting it. I'm sure there's a, a certain temperature, but, but warmish. Um, so when I was doing fermenting feed on sort of a, a larger scale and kind of experimenting with it, um, I would have a couple, three buckets, like five gallon buckets. And I kept them in my guest bathroom <laughs> in, in the bathtub um, because it does expand and there is those, those live cultures. So sometimes they, it kind of um, bubbles over. Oops. So, so wait, you had bathtub. five gallon buckets? Mm -hmm. For how many birds? I don't know. Uh, more than fifty. Yeah. <laughs> more more than fifty between all of my pins. I have the chickens, guinea fowl, turkeys, pheasants, pigeons, quail, and I probably forgot somebody in that list. Holy smokes! Oh, pea fowl. Oh, oh, right. Okay, so when you're fermenting, we were f given the instruction to ferment due to the injury that we were rehabbing. Mm -hmm. What are some other reasons why you would choose to, to ferment feed? So one of the um, surprising benefits of it um, is that it makes their poop less smelly. Um, so if you're in an urban area or you don't want to have to deal with that smell, um, that's a benefit of it. Um, but, you know, it really just increases their, their gut um, microbiome and healthier guts means less illnesses. So, um, you know, it just makes for a healthier chicken, uh, all, all around. Um, and I think, you know, we all want to have healthy birds, um, because they are our pets. Now you say it, it lasts for only a certain time and you've got to either put out just enough that they'll eat it because you don't want to waste it. How do you keep the rest of it or can you keep the rest of it? Do you have to whatever you're making, do you have to use it when you use it or can you refrigerate it and, and use it sparingly? So it's sort of a, um, when it's ready, you need to use it within 24 hours. So that's why I had a three bucket system and it, and it takes a while, honestly, to figure out um, how big of a container, how much food, how much water, because everybody has a different sized flock. And then the food that you use, it's not really just uh, this much food to this much water, wait this many days, because um, some foods will um, expand and absorb more water, depending on your temperature, it might take longer or quicker to ferment. Um, so it's just kind of a process. So um, once, once you kind of figure out how much you need, then you can kind of tweak your process into, um, I have this many birds, they eat this much food. I want to feed it, 
either as a treat or as a daily um, food replacement. So I need this much. Um, so and I'm assuming with fermentation, it eventually turns into alcohol. How do you, if you're going to do this daily, how do you stop your birds from becoming alcoholics? <laughs> you, you don't give it to them. Uh, you give it to them before it gets alcohol. So uh, think yogurt, you know, yogurt doesn't have an alcohol content. Um, but I imagine if you let yogurt sit too long in the fridge, it would turn into something funky. I don't really know what it would turn into, but, um, you know, it could potentially mold or, or the alcohol or, or just gross, you know, that sourness. So how long do you have typically before, like they didn't finish it, you have to go get it before it starts getting soury or they start getting liquored up. <laughs> so, um, like after you feed them in the morning or yes, yeah, so like you put the fermented feed in mm -hmm. in the morning. How long of a window do you have? And I imagine it probably is temperature responsive, but how long do you typically have before you got to go check it and say, okay, I got to get it out of there before it molds or something. So when you give them their daily ration, that's not so much the issue. It's um, leaving it in the bucket for lack of better terms for too long that's where it'll start to go bad um, but you should feed them what they'll eat in a 30 minute period because um, as that uh, active those active cultures are exposed to air they'll they'll die um, over a period of time so if you can give them what they'll eat within 30 minutes that's ideal um, if you left it out there all day and they didn't eat it, all of it it's not going to be an issue because that dish or or whatever you gave them the bowl in the morning for the food um, that itself won't go bad. It's if you left your um, fermentation bucket for longer than three days, let's say you went on vacation, you came back two weeks later, you know, that's not going to be usable. That's going to be bad. Right. Right. So do you ever have a, a bird that is on fermented feed only forever, like their whole life or it's something you just do occasionally? Um, so I was experimenting with it for a while to see if it was something that I wanted to do to, um, uses their primary food source. Uh, I was looking at the possibility of using um, some higher quality feed and then fermenting it. Um, but it just, it just didn't work out between um, my busy life. And sometimes I'd get called into work and my husband wasn't thrilled about doing it in the bathroom. <laughs> so um, now I just do it on occasion as a treat. Um, so it's something like, let's say they are molting or somebody was sick or if they got you know had worms and I had to treat them for worms or something like that anytime that they're stressed or ill um, it, it's a good time to do that otherwise you know it makes a good treat as well gotcha a couple questions that came in and if anybody does have questions and anything we've talked about put them in the comments and I'll try to make sure that we get them all uh, talking now one one question here that Mary has is are we talking about grain feed only so you can ferment any kind of feed, um, whether it's pellets or crumbles or organic pellet or crumbles or mash or, um, you know, kind of that whole grain feed. Uh, you, you can ferment anything. Okay. You could even uh, do scratch. Mary Lee had a question about fermenting. Would you do this more in the wintertime or in cold weather? Um, it doesn't matter. Just know that if you're... Um, fermenting it of course you're fermenting it inside so it might take longer depending on how warm your house is or where you keep this fermentation you could do it something as small as a half gallon jar on your counter if you're just going to give them a little bit a day but if you're wanting to use it as a big um, replacement of their regular food then you're going to need bigger containers and more space um, so that can be a challenge because it does need to be I don't know an exact number, but I'm just going to guess it should probably be between probably 70 to 75 ish degrees. I'm going to, I'm going to ballpark it. Um, so that could be a challenge. So with the, the nutritional value of fermenting, all of those nutrients are in the feed already. The fermenting just brings it out, makes it more digestible. Mm-hmm. So those those natural cultures, it's kind of like starting sourdough. Um, I, I don't know what sort of natural magic <laughs> happens, but you know you can mix effectively uh, flour and water, 
and it becomes sourdough. There's that natural yeast that that just kind of shows up and adds the cultures. Um, unfortunately, that the more scientific background behind it, I don't I don't know. Um, but the process is sort of similar. You mix the food and with the water, and then it will um, naturally develop those good bacteria. Gotcha. Probiotics. CNL's Sienna Farm had a question: Is there a breaking in period since hens are often um, nervous about new things? I don't have that problem, I guess. So I use a um, the same dish for any sort of treats that I give them because you really shouldn't put their food on the ground. Um, that's how they can get worms and other uh, other bad diseases and things. So I have one of those uh, black rubber um, like food food bowl things. And so when they see that, they don't really care what's in it. They're pretty excited about it. They know, um, they know some good's coming. <laughs> yeah. Um. Mary had a question on, does the food get watery when you ferment it? Or are you looking to add a certain amount so it all gets absorbed? So kind of just the the quick overview on fermenting. So what you would want to do is take your container and fill it um, between one third and one half with food. Um, and then you'll top that off with water. So you want the food to be submerged in water with at least one inch. And then you'll want to check it every 12 hours because it does expand. Um, so if you need to add more water and that needs to be dechlorinated water. So if you don't have like a Berkey or something else, you can let water sit for 24 hours uh, and that will dechlorinate it. A uh, Berkey is a, a water filter, like those big uh, stainless steel water filters. So is the water coming out of our sink chlorinated? Yeah, uh, unless okay. you're on a well. If you are on city water, it'll be chlorinated. That's a, a health thing. So you so can. If, if it's chlorinated water, that kills the bacteria or that defeats the fermenting process. Right. Um, so unless you, you know, have like a built in reverse osmosis system or something that chlorine, chlorine is bad for um, the, the good bacteria. So you'll want to either dechlorinate it or let it sit for 24 hours. Um, that's one reason you should probably drink filtered waters because you have good bacteria in your gut. But that's another topic for another day. Um, so I, you'll want. I should have been told that when I was instructed <laughs> to feed fermented feed because all the benefits then I, I think I just used water from the, the sink. I probably didn't do any benefit. So it might not even ferment because of that, uh, the chlorine. Huh. So as far as the, uh, the watery feeds, so you'll, uh, You'll add the food and water, uh, make sure it stays covered with water all the time, check it every 12 hours, add more water as needed. If it starts to overflow, you're going to have to take some food out. I've made that mistake many times. Um, and then when it's time to feed, you'll want to strain off that water. So what you end up having is just kind of like oatmeal, you know, like mushy, mushy feed um, and then save that water and that water will kind of jumpstart your next batch. So it doesn't get it wouldn't be watery because you're straining it. So that's kind of like the mother in vinegar is that you kind of just mm -hmm. keep that right. process mm -hmm. using that again. Okay. Um, lots there. I probably need to digest it and hopefully we can get you back on at some point so that Thank all you. the questions that I'll think of as soon as we're done, I can ask those. <laughs> of course. But I want to talk because one of the things that we all battle and you're in Colorado, so you battle it as well is water and waterers and, you know, at this time of year, it seems like if you don't have a good heated water or a heated base that you're changing it about every hour, hour and a half, um, then you got the challenge of algae and you've got you know, constantly cleaning and keeping fresh water. So talk us through kind of your experiences with both the best kind of waterers, um, what you found success with. Sure. Um, so when I started keeping chickens back in the day, you know, up until... Um, Pretty recently, I did just like everybody else does, I I would assume, um, or in a, I actually just did a backyard chicken survey. And I can say most people <laughs> have a, uh, you know, that traditional water watering fount, like a plastic or a galvanized, um, the, the cylinder with the bowl on the right. bottom. Um, and those are awful for a ton of reasons. Uh, I, I really struggle with those. Um, you know, the plastic ones for being outside in the sun, they end up cracking and breaking. Um, it's very windy here. So that dish, of course, fills up with dirt. They step in it so they get poopy feet in there. Um, 
you know, there's, those are just awful. The galvanized ones, you can't use apple cider vinegar if that's something that you want to use. Um, or if you want to use some sort of a, a, a water-based um, medicine, if, if you need to do that, that has to be, you have to be careful with that. And then of course they freeze uh, out here in Colorado, even though I'm in a more mild part of Colorado, you know, you have to have some sort of a heat source. It does freeze at night and those, those bins are difficult or those dishes. Um, they also evaporate in the summer and our hot summer temperatures. So when I was with chickens and working these 48 hour shifts, I, I had to come up with a better watering system because I couldn't deal with water when I'm not here. Uh, I wasn't married at the time. Um, so that was a challenge. It, my husband is very helpful now, but you know, I had to adapt with these different things. So um, that's how I stumbled across the uh, poultry nipple waters or chicken nipples. Um, so I have a demonstration here. Ta -da! So they're um, basically, you know, these, these horizontal waters that go onto a bucket or a container. So what I have is those installed on a 55 gallon drum. And then I have a heater, a submersible heater in that drum. So in the winter, when it's cold outside, I only have to fill up their water maybe once a month. And it's delightful because winter and wet is awful. <laughs> okay, where'd, you get a, where'd you get a 55 gallon drum? And is it metal or plastic? Um, plastic, so they need to be installed on plastic. And I was able to find one. A gentleman locally has a um, like a, a drum cleaning business. I don't know. He gets them from different uh, food manufacturing or food storage facilities and then cleans them out and sells them. So I think it was $10 for the 55-gallon drum. So the, the, the heater that you submerge is just like a livestock feed tank heater mm -hmm. right how do the, the the metal pin in the nipple that won't freeze up so i'm going to unscrew one of these um so i can show you real quick so the nipples themselves when they're properly installed being the emphasis on properly installed um they don't freeze so um here's the the nipple right so you have the pin and then I call this part the barrel. So what happens is when they push on the pin, it pushes that O-ring back. Um, I don't know if you can see that there. Yep. Pushes yep, that no O-ring back. And then so water is released into the nipple. And if you look, if I can try and hold it straight on the, the screen, um, there's actually kind of a slant in the in the poultry nipple. Um, so the barrel's up here and then the, the little dish is right here. So it's it's slanted. Mm -hmm. So when they push on the pin, water comes out, and then when they let go, that O-ring seals it, and this is self-draining. So because of that cant that it has to it, the water drains out. So these don't hold water inside of here like a lot of the nipples do. So these don't freeze. Um, the pin won't freeze, oh. anything like that. So you have to keep the water thaw. Sometimes people get confused when I say these don't freeze, but, you know, the water in your bucket right. will. Right. And you have to have a submersible heater because these are at the bottom of your bucket. So you need the water at the bottom of, of the barrel or the bucket or whatever you're using by the poultry nipples to be thawed. So um, as long as the water in the bucket is thawed, then, then these work. Um, and they work very well. <laughs> so see if I process this whole thing. First of all, are they very difficult to install? Nope. Um, so I do have an installation tool if um, maybe you do have some challenges twisting or, or things like that that goes into a drill. But with your um, container, oh, where am I here? Yep. <laughs> I can't light up with the camera. Uh, so you just drill a hole and then you screw them in. Um, and then you don't screw them in flush. You leave them out um, so that about one or two threads are showing. How come? Um, um, because... So these are designed um, for, uh, not for installing in these thin plastic. So if you screw it in all the way, um, you would actually need a different size drill bit, which um, just isn't made. These are used with either an 11 32nd or a 3 8 inch drill bit. And there's just not something that's just a touch bigger that would be the right size. And if you screw it in all the way, then it would end up cracking potentially the container. Gotcha. So you just want to leave a few threads exposed. So it's about 80% um, threaded and, um, and that's it. That's, that's how so you do it. 
to to make sure I got it. <clears throat> when they hit the pin, mm -hmm. it shoots it back out of the barrel. The O-ring then breaks the seal. The water goes into the waterer. When they pull away from the pin, the O-ring seals it back up. It's at an angle so water doesn't stay in that barrel. It drains itself out so there's no freezing in the mechanical part of it. Correct. Correct. So, um, there is a, this little um, like lip here, um, mm -hmm. but that only holds a very small amount of water. Um, I had one gentleman that lived maybe Alaska, I'm not sure, but they were like negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit, literally in the winter, um, and had some issues with freezing there. So what I told him was you can either cut that off or drill a hole in it so that there's nothing there. But in most cases, the amount of water um, that's, that's in there is so minimal. Um, and that's why I say they need to be installed properly. So it needs to be installed um, so that your bucket sits level and that these are level so that it, they can drain. Um, right. If they're installed on a, on a surface that, you know, is like this, then these wouldn't be able to drain. And then you could potentially have um, some. Because the water would stay in the barrel at that point. Right. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and we, people can get these, we can get these on your website, heritageacresmarket.com. Yes, sir. And, um, I have a discount code for folks, uh, Coop Dreams, one word, and you can get 15% off and I do ship internationally. And that's everything in your store? Or everything just the, in the store. 15% off your order. Very kind of you. Coop Dreams code for 15% off. Okay. The last thing I wanted to get to tonight is another burning question that we all have. What's in your first aid kit? You as a paramedic yes. and a chicken keeper have to have <laughs> perfect chicken first aid kit what is in yours so mine might be a little over the top compared to to most people um it's kind of my thing i kind of like it um but i have i have a variety of things um so in my experience i've had issues with um respiratory illnesses and traumatic injuries um so those are kind of the two things that that i try to have stuff on hand for and then just the nature of my background. Uh, I try to have something for everything, which is really difficult and why I have way too, uh, too much. I have literally one of those like 27 gallon totes that's full to the brim of stuff. <laughs> stuff. Hopefully, you know, you don't need it, but it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Right. Right. Um, so I would say that for the average backyard um, chicken keeper, um, I have a kind of a list of things that I made here that are at a minimum. Um, I, I do have a backyard poultry health guide uh, ebook and some blog posts if you want more information, or you can always reach out to me and, and I can give you the whole list. But um, I would definitely make sure that you have a, uh, a kennel or some sort of an isolation, um, uh, not container, but like an isolation crate. If a hen is, or a rooster, I guess, if a chicken is sick, uh, the first thing that you want to do is isolate them. It doesn't matter if they have a traumatic injury or if they're having some sort of a medical issue. Uh, you want to isolate them from the rest of the flock. Um, so that's that's kind of a very important thing. Um, for traumatic injuries, uh, the Vetresen spray that you can get at your local farm store is amazing. Um, it works really well. I love that stuff. Uh, avoid blue coat. Uh, that used to be a really popular um, recommendation, but they came out and found that um, it's it's uh, painful on on injuries, and it can also um, potentially cause some damage. Um, so avoid blue coat. Um, of course, bandaging materials. You know, gauze, vet wrap, tape, things like that. So if they have an issue, they can. Um, you can kind of cover them up. Um, there's a product called Meta Honey. I, I'm not affiliated with this. I just really find it amazing. Um, I have used this so many times and I absolutely love it. Uh, the first time I used it was when a chicken got attacked by a coyote, uh, ripped her all the way around and I sutured her and put this stuff on and this stuff, it prevents infection and it encourages healing and it's amazing. Um, you can find it on Amazon, but if you prefer not to shop on Amazon, you can find it on wound care, like human wound care websites. I use it on myself all the time. It's amazing. Is it an animal product or a, a human product? 
it's a human wound care product. Um, it's meant for people that have like pressure ulcers, post-surgery, things like that. Um, I, I absolutely love it. So it's, it's just Manuka honey, um, hundred percent oh. active word. I can't pronounce honey. Um, it, and it's the, the stuff's amazing. I could talk that that honey for me about it. Mm -hmm. That's special honey. I had some friends that went yeah. out there. They said it's incredible. Yeah. So so this is the skin version or the wound version instead of the the food version for consumption. Yeah. So my one 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 question I was going to ask you is what's your go to? What is the thing in your first aid kit that you seem to be using the most? Would that be it? Uh, yeah. For for the I would say if it's an injury, you know, a traumatic injury, it's definitely um, I clean it with vetricin. Please don't use hydrogen peroxide. Clean it with vetricin. Uh, slather this stuff on there and wrap it in gauze. Leave the bird in the crate for a couple days, and um, and and it works fantastic. Um, I did see a question that just popped up out of the corner of my eye here for respiratory infections from Mary. Um, respiratory infections can be more challenging, but my go-to for that, um, which is off label for laying hens. So this is going to be one of those personal choice things. Uh, there's a product called five in one, um, like the number five in the number one. Um, it's generally sold on pigeon supply stores and it's called five in one because it has the um, medications in it needed to treat coccidiosis, canker, worms, and then it has electrolytes and probiotics. So if you have a sick chicken, and you're not really sure why she's sick, um, you could use my book, but you can also give her this five in one and it will pretty much treat anything that's wrong with it um, for the most part, as far as illnesses. Um, that being said, there's some debate on whether or not the dewormer that's in there is um, should be used with laying hens. So again, that's something that I would encourage everybody to make their own personal decision on. Um, it's not an FDA approved product for chickens and that's why you buy it from the pigeon feed store so did i hear correctly after the coyote attack you stitched up your hen yeah <laughs> sure did <laughs> so like for even even our really calm hens if i'm gonna even attempt to suture them up they're gonna go crazy how do you do that how do you calm them down or keep them still well, unfortunately, she was so stressed from the incident. Um, I, I sutured her. I, I had the stuff on hand. Um, better to have it and, you know, when you need it. Um, so she was kind of um, not sedated, but she was, I think, just overwhelmed from the whole situation that she didn't have a whole lot of energy. Um, she ran from a coyote, got picked up by a coyote. The story is we were outside. She was out there the coyote came and picked her up the guinea fowl told us that uh there is there was the coyote my husband being the athletic man that he is went running after this coyote hurdled the fence with no hands a split rail four foot fence leaped it went running after the coyote caught up to the coyote scared the coyote coyote dropped chicken coyote ran away <laughs> so then we were able to get the chicken and, uh, and that chicken survived mm-hmm they make movies about guys like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my husband. <laughs> okay. A couple of questions that popped in. Um, Margaret asked, what do you use to prevent pecking? If you've got a, an injured chicken, there's blood. What, what do you do there? Um, the best thing to do is to isolate that injured chicken. Um, use something like this meta honey or, um, you know, whatever you choose to use. Uh, wait till she's healed and then put her back. Gotcha. Okay. Another one was, do you use Thailand? First of all, what is Thailand? So Thailand is a, um, an, an, an antibiotic, uh, that you can use for respiratory infections. Um, I do use Thailand. It's increasingly difficult to find the stuff that I have is older. I don't know that you can find it in the store anymore. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but I do use Thailand. Um, I've used it for, uh, my PFAL, um, she's had uh i just lost the word anyway she's had a respiratory infection a couple times pfal are kind of prone to it i'm not really sure why um and, and it works great so on um, this you know julie Matson says that you can get manuka honey at any store it's not just manuka honey in that 
thing, is it? No. So um, I don't know if it has an ingredient list. Probably probably not. I'm sure it does on the packaging. Um, but uh, in addition to the 100% uh, leptospirerium, let's just go with it, honey. It has, um, so there's, there's a, a gel and a paste, and this is the gel. And I don't know if I can read on the fly here, but it's, uh, it keeps the wound moist. So it has some sort of, um, gelling. It says gelling agents to act to maintain physical integrity and viscosity of the dressing. So fancy word for saying it just helps keep the wound wet because, um, keeping wounds moist, like, uh, like with band-aids and stuff, um, heal it better than a dry wound. Um, I did not know that. Quick I would have thought there would be more see. bacteria with moisture. Um, it it helps with the skin growth and, and things like that. So keeping it a uh, sterile, um, a s s clean sterile environment. So using like your vetricin to clean it, um, and then putting something like this on it, and then changing the dressings daily. So once a day, take that stuff off, spray it again with the vetricin, put a new coat of this, uh, meta honey, put another um new layer of uh of bandages on it and and it it heals incredibly quick like three four days quick nicole you are absolutely incredible <laughs> this you. was awesome what a great class um we can find you at heritageacresmarket.com yes sir and um, sir please <laughs> <laughs> and and there we've got um, you've got links to your social media. People can get the blog. People can listen to the podcast. They can get the products, all yep. that. Um, and then, so of course the website, uh, and if you have any other questions, if I've said something that, that you would like more information on, um, it's probably on the website, uh, but you can also reach out to me. Uh, my email is hello at heritageacresmarket.com, or I do have a texting platform, and so you can shoot me a text. Um, the number there is 719-292-3207. That is awesome. You, you really are. This was absolutely a great class. I'm, I'm loving it. I'm going to go back and rewatch it because I'm certain I missed a little bit. Hopefully... We can get you on again at some point. I'd love to. And anybody that wants to pick up uh, any of the products or check out Nicole's site, it's heritageacresmarket.com. And if you use the code Coop Dreams, one word, you get 15% off. Thank you, everybody, for coming to class. Nicole, you're Thank awesome. You Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.